This is yeah. Creator Culture by Hashtag Paid. Hey, I'm Danny DeSatnik, and if you're new here, this is a podcast all about creators. Every week, I'm chatting with incredible creators, and sometimes the people that support them. I really want to understand three things. How creators are building their brands, what their brand partnerships look like, and what can we all expect in the future from this incredible world of creators. So, welcome to week one. And selfishly, it's a big one. I have been itching to get this podcast out for so, so long. But also, both me and the guest went to the same university. Shout out Wilfred Laurier. I'm talking to Aisha Haroon. Aisha is a Canadian-born creator who's been part of a small group on YouTube that's paved the way in the beauty and lifestyle space for black hijabi women. Her roots on the platform, they go back something like a decade as she started to upload videos in 2011. How wild is it to think that someone has consistently been uploading to a platform for over a decade? I can barely keep up with Instagram posting maybe once every year. Recently, she was named to YouTube's 2021 creator class representing Black voices. I mean, talk about an accomplishment. So let's get to the good stuff. Here's my conversation with Aisha Haroon. All right, Aisha. Well, I think we were just talking. Our roots go back a little bit. Um, they do. We've actually done. I haven't interviewed you before, but I've worked with people that have interviewed you before, <laughs> and it's pretty wild to see how far you've come. First off, I have to congratulations are in order. I saw that you're part of the YouTube Black Voices Creator Class of 2021. Yes, yes, uh, big. Honestly, one of the biggest accomplishments in my career so far. That is that is what what does that mean? Like in terms of not okay, we'll get to the spiritual side, yeah. but like what does that mean in terms of how are they supporting you? What are you getting from this? So they it's it's a grant. So they gave a cool. pretty hefty grant, which was really, really great because it's I think it was the first time like a brand, let alone YouTube, actually invested in my content and on such like a large scale. So I'm able mm-hmm. to use that money that was granted to me to kind of reinvest into my channel, reinvest into my team, just kind of create better content. So yeah, it's they it kind of just gave a lump sum of money and was like, do what you need with this and we're here to support you. So it was pretty cool. So wild. So yeah. wild. <laughs> have you blown the money already? I have not. I have not. I've, I'm, I'm maintaining my my uh, humbleness with that, with that grant for sure. <laughs> well, I feel like that humbleness goes back to we went to the same university. We I don't did. Know if, I don't know if anyone here is even going to know about Wilfrid Laurier University, but yes. it's an hour outside of Toronto in Waterloo where BlackBerry was started. It yeah. is a tech hub in Canada. But what's pretty crazy is that going throughout, like, throughout school, I don't remember. I remember there were two creators that I knew of at school, but like it wasn't really a big thing. The bigger thing was, are you working at Shopify? Are you yeah. working at Google? Yet, like, here's you. Like, <laughs> Throughout university, you're entrepreneur, <laughs> an entrepreneur in your own right, like paving a way for a black hijabi woman, yeah. uh, trying to deal with that. And there were no eyes, whereas today it'd be so different. Like, what was that? What was that like being a creator in a business school? Yeah, where it almost felt like people didn't even notice how big you were, like the potential of what a content creator could be. Well, honestly, I kept it very under wraps. I don't. I think I really only told like my roommates about it and like a few of my friends. So it wasn't even like this big thing. It was just kind of like a hobby at the time um, and like a passion project of mine. And I would just kind of upload videos here and there between classes. I think it, once it grew to a point where like people were noticing that I, you know, create videos online, they were looking at my Instagram and seeing like, Oh, what is she linking to? Um, yeah, it was, it was really interesting because, you know, in, in our first or second year, I think that's when we apply for co-op and I didn't get into co-op. So I thought that was like the end of the world for me as a business yeah. student because I went to Laurier for the co-op program. Genuinely. And, um, you know, later down the line, I get an internship with Kin Community, which is like a YouTube multi-channel network slash agency in Canada. And that kind of opened up the world to, okay, co-op isn't the end of the world. Like if you don't get in, you can still do a lot with your life and it's, it's really great to see kind of how far I've come from that to like where I am today. Well, one, I'll make sure that no one at Wilfrid Laurier <laughs> University's administration listens to that because they, <laughs> they they want you to believe that co-op is be all end all. And yeah. 
I remember that struggle. But yeah. that's so, so that's so interesting that you you pulled an internship at. You said it was called Kin Community? Yeah, so they're based in, I think they just are under Chorus now. They got bought out by Chorus Entertainment. Okay, cool. Yeah. And so were you helping to broker deals between their talent and the brands that, that they were working with? Yeah, so it was, a, it was a, I think the actual role was a partner strategy slash marketing intern. Cool. So it was a four-month summer internship and basically I helped kind of manage the partners that were already on their roster, um, create events for them. And then I also later down the line was able to kind of strategize uh, strategize with the brands and figure out campaigns, um, figure out who, what type of creators are going to be great for those campaigns. So it's probably similar to what um, hashtag paid does a lot, like with all the briefs, like create, Mm. you know, you get the RFPs, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like forgetting all the terminology. (laughs) Yeah. And I would like create those decks and be like, okay, this person's good for this because of that. And blah, blah, blah. So it was the first time I feel like I actually learned the business side of YouTube because for so long I was doing just, it was, it was a passion of mine. I didn't even know people were making that much money off of it. Yeah. And so in that setting, Mm -hmm. What were the types of deals that were being done? Was it a lot of like one-off bigger production? Was it longer term? So I find they had actually a lot of um, longer term partners. So there was a lot with, it was mainly like beauty and lifestyle brands um, and also a lot of food. They work with a lot of food creators. So for example, there was some Neutrogena campaigns. There were like silk, you know, the silk almond milks and stuff campaigns. And they would kind of... Um, they would be kind of reoccurring, but some of them would be one off. I would say majority of them were long term, though. So it was great because I was able to create kind of like a longer term strategy with those brands yeah. um, and kind of see how they would fit into the different creators at different points of their lives. Because there were some creators that were like mom and lifestyle. And there was others that were like still in university and school. There was others that were just like just graduating and figuring out what to do with their lives. Mm. So it's really interesting to see that dynamic. I feel like you fell into the perfect situation there. Like yeah. you could all, you could almost dream up and see what was coming in the next three, five years, kind of plot yeah. your path. And so what made a great, like the creators that you were, wor- that King community was working with, yeah. what were the qualities of those creators, whether it was from like a, a personal level or a business perspective that mm-hmm. you valued? I actually really valued their production value. Like, and they were all Canadian creators. That's the the creators that we were working with. Like their production value was so amazing. I feel like it kind of inspired me to really up my creative as well in terms of my content. Um, they actually had like full on production teams. Um, some of the creators included like Hot for Food, um, Yolanda from How to Cake It, uh, Allegra Shaw. So there was kind of like a a large, there was kind of a varying amount of creators, but it was just really interesting to see their different like editing styles and, um, how like, you know, creating kind of a vision for how their video would turn out and seeing what the actual end result is. Mm -hmm. And then like pulling all the analytics. And it's just like, it taught me so much about the behind the scenes of YouTube that I knew nothing about. And at the time I was still creating videos. I had about 50,000 subscribers that entire summer. So it was really kind of like an inspiring moment for me to be like, Hey, maybe I should actually consider this as, you know, a full-time career. It was nothing that actually crossed my mind before, but Mm -hmm. I think because I was in my third year, um, going into my fourth year, I was going into, uh, um, what's it called? I went to France also for a study abroad. I was kind of just thinking about what I wanted to do after I came back from my study abroad. And I was just kind of like, I feel like I could do this. Like there's someone missing in this roster that looks like me. And I feel like I could fill that void. <laughs> so, okay. I love that you say that there, yeah. I feel so often, whether you're in the tech space or a business context or a creator context, mm-hmm. I think the the most excitement comes from, hey, I either can't see myself that I'm looking up to, or two, there's an intersection that I can play at that I don't see a home for. Yeah. And so it sounds like that was that was almost maybe not the mentality. That must have been tough, no yeah. doubt, trying to figure out how do I trek that path. I know when I played sports when I was younger, you look up to people that kind of looked like me with muscles that were maybe like five times as big. Yeah. But like that's who I looked up to. So how did you go about carving your path if there wasn't a, I'm not going to say a North Star, but really like an an image to try, aspire to. 
I mean, you're right. There wasn't really anything to aspire to at the time. Like I started my channel, I was 16 years old. It was 2011. So we're going on almost a decade since I've been doing this, which is kind of crazy. Um, And at that time there were no black Muslim women, let alone hijabi women doing beauty and lifestyle um, Mm -hmm. on YouTube. So there wasn't really like a blueprint for me to follow. I feel like what I did was just, I was really inspired by the creators that I was watching, even though they didn't look like me. I just knew that I enjoyed that content and I feel like someone who looks like me might be able to enjoy the content that I create as well. And it was never like a moment where that's why I started my channel. It was just, I was passionate about beauty and I just wanted to make videos because I was bored one summer. (laughs) But I think over time it became, you know, people all over the world being like, Oh look, there's someone who looks like me on the internet. That's so cool. Let's subscribe to her. And it kind of just turned into this whole engine without me even realizing. Um, And it's great now to see like so many people, I don't want to say following my, in my footsteps, but it's great to see like a community of people doing very similar things that I am because there wasn't that when I started, you Mm -hmm. know, there was no representation at all. (laughs) That's going to be my clickbait. Yeah. It's going to be started out making videos because she was bored. Now part of the YouTube creator class. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. I mean, that's essentially what happened, though. Yeah. Yeah. And so, okay, so you're in you're in school. You realize, yeah. like, you, you're working in community. You realize that you have something. You kind of find this passion, this, this pocket. I'm assuming you're going out and trying to find brand deals. Yeah. I yes and no. Okay. <laughs> so I didn't. I didn't even know. Like, truthfully, I didn't know what brand deal, like how you could even get brand deals. I thought like you just had to reach 100,000 subscribers and then brands would just come to you. Like that was legit my intention. I had no idea. So after I graduated um, or even, you know, between the time I was almost graduating, um, I started reaching out to like friends that I already knew in the industry, like just people that I've maybe went to like one or two events with. And I was just kind of like, oh, I see you working with brands. Like, how do you do that? Hmm. Um, so it was a matter of just kind of working with my friends and trying to figure out like, Oh, like, do you have a content contact that I could reach out to? Like, what are the, what are the ways that you've been able to attract brands? Um, and it was just a matter of me, honestly, cold emailing, like constantly that entire summer after I graduated from like May to August, it was just me reaching out to brands. Like probably I was sending like 10 emails a day, just introducing myself because at that point, even though I had quite a large following, I hit a hundred thousand subscribers, like literally the day that I graduated, like the day of Laurier's commencement, which is pretty dope. Wild. (laughs) Yeah. Um, that day, like I, I assumed, okay, I have a huge following. People are going to reach out to me, but that wasn't the case because at Mm. the time there wasn't really much like diversity and inclusion wasn't really on people's minds. Mm. So I had to put myself in front of the brands. Um, and yeah, I just kind of focused on just creating really good content to the point where like the brands could not ignore me. Like I'm already sharing your product. Your products are being sold. I could clearly see from the affiliate links that I'm using, like <laughs> let's work together. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's so what one, the fact that you crossed a hundred thousand streams. Yeah. The day that you graduate school. Yeah. Is such a like that's such a send off in your mind. You're like, I needed a hundred thousand followers or subscribers to be something. Yeah. The day you happened. leave, the day you leave the institution that you're paying tons of cash to, year yeah. in year out, <laughs> half the information we probably even forget. You're now at a hundred thousand, which is insane. Yeah. How did you think about going, or like reaching out to these brands? What was important for you when communicating your value to the brands? So I first started by creating what I call like a chase list. Like I literally sat down and I wrote all the brands that I've featured in my, you know, channels before, um, all the brands that I personally love, maybe brands that I just feel like I want to work with in the future sometime. Um, and those brands included like Estee Lauder, Maybelline, L'Oreal, um, you know, just a bunch of different brands. And I honestly, I would reach out to them through DM I would, you know, create videos on their products and be like, oh, I would love to be added to your PR list. Um, It was basically just anything. I would, I had this kind of, I want to call it like an elevator pitch, but like email style. So like Mm. an email pitch. Um, And I would just kind of change it up slightly for the brands and then include links to my YouTube channels of like 
products that I featured their, um, or sorry, videos that I featured their products in and be like, Hey, I've created content on your product before would love to be added to your PR list. If you ever have a paid opportunity in the future, I'd love to be kept top of mind. And it was just kind of that I would follow up like here and there. And I feel like that's how I've kind of created my initial base of like the brands that I started working with. And I could say now, like all the brands that I put on my chase list, I've been able to work with, which is like pretty amazing. So I feel like once you have a goal in mind, like figuring out how to get to the end goal is a little bit easier. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so one, uh, also insane. Like <laughs> four or five years ago, you're thinking of these massive brands you're trying to work with. And now yeah. they accept you for who you are, plus you're, you're on their roster, yeah. which is an incredible full cir- circle moment. Mm-hmm. When you're thinking of setting your rates, yeah. Right? so you're, like here's Aisha, she's got this following, she's got this passion, incredible content uh, creator coming out mm-hmm. of university trying to figure out how to get in touch with these brands. Where do you like? Where do you go to assess your value? I think that yeah. is, it's, it's such a heavy topic because you want to represent yourself, but then you also want the brand deal. Yeah, and you you want to put yourself like there's so many elements. How do you think about this? It was tough in the beginning. Like I had no idea, and I could say like my first paid, <laughs> my first paid YouTube video that I ever got. <laughs> literally $20. And I thought that was like, so cool. Yeah, it was $20. Um, it was, I mean, I barely had like 10,000 subscribers at the time. So it was fine. I was just like, Oh my God, someone wants to pay me $20 to talk about their product. I thought it was a great deal, but it obviously now I'm like laughing at it. So I just had to share that because you know, (laughs) we've come a long way. Um, I use different apps. I want to say like there was this one, um, I don't know if it's still around, but social blue book, was this like website where you can kind of input all of your information, um, your YouTube account, like how many views you get per month, et cetera. And it'll kind of spit out a number of like what you should uh, value yourself at. I personally, like even back then thought it was quite low um, because I'm like, okay, if I'm putting this much effort into a video, I feel like I deserve more than that. Um, But actually, I mean, and I, this, this isn't even related. Well, it is kind of related. It's just funny that it, you work for hashtag paid now. Um, the actual, I think when you go into the portal of hashtag paid, there's a place where you can like add your information and like your view count and stuff. And you can do like a competitive rate, so, like an average rate or something else. And mm. that was really helpful to me. And that was the first time where I like mm. put in all of my information. I was like, Whoa, that number seems really high to me. But if that's what like, you know, an agency is saying I should get paid. Like, I'm just going to take it and go. So it was just kind of trial and error. I would spew out a number. I would just say, okay, here's my rate is $2,000 for this post. And if the brand says, no, that's way too much. I'd be like, okay, like what, what's your budget then? And we just kind of work through there. So I think it was just a lot of trial and error, but I, I definitely was never shy about increasing my rates. Because I'm like the least they can like, you know, if they're already reaching out to work with me, the most they're going to do is say no and negotiate down. So I might as well not sell myself short because I feel like that's what a lot of creators do. They'll sell themselves short because they have no idea. Mm -hmm. Um, And the last thing I feel like just asking around, asking friends, some people I feel like are a little bit stingy to talk about rates and stuff, but I feel like the more transparency we have in this industry that already has so little transparency, like we're going to get further. So that's kind of how I see it. And so now you're at this point where, so you have, so YouTube is like your bread is still your bread and butter main, main, main channel. Yeah. There's Instagram. Yeah. You you have TikTok as well. I do, yeah. How do you think about different rates for different platforms? Like you're at a point now where you are of incredible success, incredible size. Mm -hmm. And so each channel has its own inventory or or its own value depending on your relationship or whatever you go about doing with that channel and those followers. Yeah. Is that a consistent? Is that a consistent battle of like I'm going to continuously up my rates depending on the amount of activity? How do you go about determining those rates per channel? I feel like it's a little bit easier now because I do have a team that I work with, so I have a manager um, and you know a talent coordinator as well um, that helps kind of manage my content. So I feel like now it's a lot easier to scale that and sure. kind of figure out what works. Um, but I will say, you know although YouTube is my bread and butter, that's like where I love to put out my content. Instagram has honestly, 
if not surpassed my income with YouTube, wow. um, or it's like pretty on par. So I will say like my highest rates are definitely with YouTube because obviously not only is that like my highest follower amount, but it also takes the longest time. I feel like a lot of people don't realize like you should be charging for the amount of time it takes to create that video. Like if you have a super high quality production, um, you should be charging for that too, because it's, you know, it's not free. <laughs> um, so I think like keeping that in mind also, um, yeah, I, I think for TikTok is kind of interesting. I'm like just starting to do a lot more branded campaigns with TikTok. And even then, like it's my smallest audience, but I'm still getting like pretty on par rates even with my Instagram, which is interesting to me. Wow. So I think um, it's a cross between production value, um, obviously follower account follower amount. And I think there's a lot more transparency online. Like people can easily Google, like how much should I be charged or how much should I charge if I have this amount of followers or subscribers and they can kind of get a number, but it's taking that number, adding on like whatever notoriety you have in that category. So for myself, um, skincare, I usually put a little bit more of a premium because most of my content is focused around skincare and that's like my best selling or best, um, translating content as well. Yeah. Um, and then your production value. So it's kind of just a mix of everything. Makes sense. You're, yeah. you're a creative and your creative agency and a production house all in one. Yeah. It's, it's just people are so used to this idea of this incorporated business that has mm-hmm. art directors and creative directors and photographers. And you go to them for these large scale productions. And so you're, they're thinking like, okay, I'm going to put a, tens of thousand dollars to that. Yeah. But you're producing the same quality and not yeah. even same quality. It's like your audience knows what you, your audience knows what you want, what they want. And that's why they're here for you. So exactly. that's, that's the sauce. And so when that comes into play, like with brands, I feel like that's the, that's one of the hardest parts is this mm-hmm. creative control. Yeah. Is you have the odd, it's your brand, it's your company. Like the, the people are here for you. They're not yeah. here for another brand or just for YouTube. How do you go about communicating that? with a brand where they want control, but you know what's best. And but you yeah. also want to alienate your audience because they can sniff, yeah. definitely can sniff if it's, if this isn't a true partnership that you believe in. Um, I think I've gotten to the point now where I only work with brands that I have either featured before brands that I personally really, really love and brands that I know that my audience will actually love as well. Um, so that's kind of just how I immediately ensure that people are still going to enjoy the content regardless of whether it's sponsored or not. Mm. Um, but I also make it a point to educate the brand and be like, okay, I understand this is the type of content you want to see, but that doesn't work for me. Um, I don't like, for example, a lot of brands and there was a point where like they wanted fully dedicated videos on this one product, nothing else. Like they don't want you to talk about anything else with this one product. And I'm like, that's great. I'm sure you could do that on your channels, but it doesn't work for me (laughs) because like I'm Aisha, I'm yes, I'm a brand, but I'm also a personality. Like that. I, I, I use these products, but just creating essentially an infomercial isn't going to work on my content. So I kind of just work with them to educate them. And I think also, you know, communicating those values to my team as well and my manager. So they also know before I even get you know, the final offer, they're going to have those conversations with the brand and be like, okay, integrations work the best for Aisha. This is what, you know, will be the best for both of you. So this is what we're going to (laughs) do. So it's just making sure you communicate that. I think there's a lot more flexibility now with brands. They're starting to understand that. But I think you mentioned in the beginning, like, you know, the Unilevers and, and the, the, the bigger, the PNGs, like the bigger brands can sometimes not understand that, Yes, you're tapping into an influencer, you're paying this influencer for your content, but at the end of the day, they are a content creator and they are in charge of their content. Like they know what's going to work. So it, it really is just a play. And I love when I'm able to like hop on a Zoom call or a phone call with the brand and talk through a strategy to see what will work. Yeah. And I can share my ideas. Um, I think it definitely has to be a collaborative effort because in the end, it has to be mutually beneficial. Yeah. And that point of educating the brand, Mm -hmm. I think is so, so interesting. There's traditionally, it's the other way around. It's like, hey, we we do billions of dollars in business. Let us show you how to be a business. But now you're like, no, 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 let me show you how to win a trusted audience. So now you're going to listen to me. 
And you spoke about defining what works for you and and showing that brand why it works for you and why Mm -hmm. what they want won't. What else in your experience is necessary when educating the brand or at least can get them from a place, uh, when I say them, but get, let's say, marketers and their team from Mm -hmm. a very defined position to one where maybe it starts to bridge the gap for them to understand that they're working with someone who has a trusted audience and you have to put that, that, that trust in them. Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing brands need to realize is we've spent years brainstorming, creating content, being our own production, uh, you know, being our own agency, being a one person team. We spent years. I'm now doing this for nearly a decade. Mm. So I really understand my audience as if they were like a person, as if they were like a friend. Like I know what they want. I know what they like out of my content. When I create a video, I know I have an idea of like how successful that video is going to be. Um, and that's really what a brand is tapping into. They're not just tapping into like an ad placement. You're tapping into a person that has such a strong connection with their audience to the point where if they recommend a product, people are, people will purchase it. That's Mm. what you're tapping into. That's what you're paying for. So I think once you realize that you realize, okay, I'm trusting this person. And I think it's also like a brand's um, responsibility to really do research on the influencers they're working with. Um, so that it can be like a trusting relationship and they can be like, okay, this is the type of quality we get from Aisha. This is the type of quality she puts out. We'd love to tap into that. And we trust her work ethic. We trust her content and creativity and let's work together to create something really great. As opposed to just, this is the brief that we've created. Find a couple creators that like might work for it and tell them to like repeat it. <laughs> it doesn't yeah. work. Yeah. Yeah. So transactional versus mm-hmm. human to human realizing that, long game, not, not short game. Can, is yeah. there an example in your mind of a great brand partnership? Uh, yeah. I mean, I have, I've had a long-term partnership with Fabletics, um, nice. which is an athletic slash like athleisure company. They were a brand that I was always talking about before we started working together. Like I personally mm-hmm. loved their products. Um, and then, you know, they finally saw all of that and they offered me a long-term partnership last year that partnership went great. Um, the thing that I really love about working with them is, um, they do set out like, this is the type of content that you're going to do this month, but how you create it and what you do with it is totally up to you. Mm -hmm. So for example, they trust the creators they work with so much that we don't even have to give approvals for the stories that we create. Like I can just publish them. I can wear what I'm wearing today and be like, Hey, I'm wearing this for Fabletics, do the FTC disclosure and I'm good. And they trust that it's going to be, um, you know, the type of content that they want. So I feel like that's been my favorite collaboration um, that Mm. I've had. And and they did end up renewing. So I'm another, I have another year long partnership with them, which is amazing. I think it's just anytime. Thank you. Anytime that a brand just like really values the creator, I think it just makes such a great partnership. And I can't say enough great things about them. Um, They've been others as well. Um, But yeah, that's like my, my one notable one. That's the one. Yeah. It reminds me of, I remember listening to, uh, I think he's the chief brand officer. I think he's the chief brand officer of Gymshark. His name Mm -hmm. is Noel Mack. Mm -hmm. And he has this, he has a pretty similar mindset to what it sounds like with Fabletics where it's, hey, there's a reason that these athletes and or people have an audience and they've Mm -hmm. tapped into that. And so we want to tap into that. We understand that you're not going to trash us. We're not here to trash you. Like this is symbi- a symbiotic relationship. Yeah. And so we're going to let you do your thing, and we'll like we'll evaluate it along the way. But of we're going to let we're going to let you do your thing. And I I think that's such a it's a, such an easy thing to do. It's sorry, it's an easy thing to say. Mm-hmm. I think it's a harder thing to do because of giving up creative control. Yeah. But to your point when it works. Man, like, look at the way you're talking about Fabletics. Like, it, yeah. it's almost as if you are an employee for Fabletics. Exactly. Yeah, it, it really just creates a trust and just a love between the company. Like, I, you know, even after we end this partnership, if it doesn't renew, like, I'm still going to love this brand. I'm still going to talk about them. And I think that's like sure. the best collaborations to have. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, talk to me about the other side now. So, you mm-hmm. are near this. You're this content creator. Yeah. You've done incredibly well. You continue to do incredibly well. Thank you. The relationship with the audience, though, I think is 
such is one that's so interesting. Now yeah. we're, we're moving away from just, oh, work on social media platforms and there's likes, shares, and comments to platforms like Patreon and other platforms where you can actually own that relationship with that audience. Yeah. But before we go there, you spoke about like sometimes your audience will tell you what they love mm-hmm. and what they like. What is that? What does that line of communication look like? Is it just through Instagram story polls? Do you have a dedicated site and or email new like email that people can go to? How mm-hmm. does that relationship work with the with the audience that you built? Well, I think what's interesting about creators is you really have to be available everywhere (laughs) because once someone you know loves your content they love you for you especially if you do like beauty and lifestyle like that's you you're not selling a person you're selling yourself essentially Mm -hmm. um so being able to be accessible on all platforms um is really important for a while I never used my Instagram I think only about four years ago when I went full time, that's when I started using my Instagram as a way to push out more content and interact with my followers. And I think from that shift, I've really seen just a stronger relationship. So I think, you know, Instagram DMs, I respond to a lot of them, like story swipe ups, I'll respond to those. And if they're asking like, Hey, do you have a link for that shirt you're wearing? Like sending it to them. And I get comments from people like, Oh my God, I can't believe you just replied to me. Like I was, except I was expecting you to like, just ignore me. Yeah. But I really do see my followers and my community as a community. Like they are my friends. They are my family. They support my lifestyle and my business. Mm. Um, so it makes sense to continue to interact with them. And uh, I think what's great is through YouTube, like I'm able to see people that have been following me since I was in high school, since I was like, since my prom video, like still commenting to today. And and I, I remember their names and I am able to like, just really understand what they're going through and and they're able to see what I'm going through and Mm. just, it, it really builds this whole like relationship and community. And now that I'm on TikTok, like they can see another side of me. And I think the more accessible you are, Although it can feel like you're spreading yourself thin, I feel like it just kind of grows your community even more. Yeah. And so what about what about this idea of like every I love the saying where it goes, every community has a community. Yeah. So there's the community, there's the, the followers of Aisha Haroon. Mm-hmm. But within that community, because it's been there for so long. I'm sure like they now know each other or or they're talking to each other for their own routines. Yeah. Is that something you ever th- you think about is like helping to cultivate beyond just your channel, but creating that community within the community? Yeah. And I think it's, they do see that like a lot of my most like vulnerable videos and just videos where I'm like sharing information. Like I will mention in the video, like, please leave your own experiences in the comments so other mm. people can interact with them. Other people can learn from them and people actually do like they will leave comments. People will reply to them. There'll be threads of people going back and forth being like, Oh, like, you know, thanks for sharing this. Or, you know, I tried out this product. This works for me. It really has become its own community and people will interact with them. It's so beautiful to see. It's like wow. seeing your children love each other. <laughs> but, um, yeah. It, it really has become its own like little community. I wish there was a way to expand on that even more. Mm. Um, but I haven't figured that out yet. Have you heard of, there's an app called Geneva. I haven't. No. Okay. So no. someone, someone else who tipped me, tipped me off to this and essentially it's an app where think of it as clubhouse, like in the sense that there's rooms and yeah. you set up your own room and then mm-hmm. your followers can come into that room 24 seven to interact. I think it's oh. like any other, I think it's like any other chat room that you open up or group that you open up. Yeah. But it sounds like that would just be a natural next step because it's, it seems like people are talking about you and talking yeah. about what you do for them naturally. Yeah. That, that it moves That's actually that really interesting. I'm going to look into that. I'll that send it really cool. Yeah. I'll send it to you after. Thank you. <laughs> so, so what about going beyond, like going beyond YouTube or going beyond just your name in yeah. the sense that I feel like this is the million dollar question that all content that all creators are now trying to ask themselves is hey, mm-hmm. like businesses are seeing us for more than just an individual with a following. Yeah. There are companies that are getting built to help creators go above and beyond and become their own businesses. And also just having your face and your voice in every single video is tough and it's tiring. Yeah. And so how do you think about growing your brand? Is there like a next step that you're thinking of? I'm 
constantly thinking of that next step there. I have a lot of ideas and I definitely, you know, down the line, as much as I love creating content, I just don't know how long I will be doing this. Like I can't see, I can't see myself quitting it or stopping anytime soon. Sure. But it could happen in like 10, 20 years. Who knows how long people are going to continue watching me. So I've always wanted to just create something off platform that is more than just my name is more than just, you know, Aisha, the YouTuber or Aisha, the influencer. Um, So that would look like, you know, products that would look like either an apparel line or a skincare line or something. I think I'm just figuring out how to go about that right now. And just like building relationships as well with people in the industry and learning from them. Um, And one thing that I'm trying to do a lot more is, is expand on just the collaborations that I have with the current brand partners that I have. So for example, I've also had a long-term partnership with a skincare brand called Biosense. And this past February, um, we launched a collaboration together, which was like a little, um, like a skincare set. And that was really interesting just to gather data and be like, see if people were actually interested in something like that. And it was actually really successful. I also launched a hijab collaboration last year or yeah, early last, was it 2019? Oh my God. The years are like, (laughs) (laughs) I think it was 2019. It's a vortex right now. (laughs) Yeah, it really is. Um, But that was also really interesting just to like, I'm, I'm really, I feel like analytics based. Like I love studying my analytics and seeing what has been working for me. Mm. So I feel like just, right now I'm in the steps of gathering data to see where I actually want to go. But I feel like I have to do something. There's almost a little pressure because I'm like, I feel like I have to do something sooner rather than later because how long will I be able to cultivate this audience? I feel Mm. like I have a really strong, loyal audience, but I would want to expand on that and like grow it even further through products. So yeah. Yeah. And and so what you're thinking about your own, your own products Mm -hmm. is there a reason you would go your own or like go about your product with your own label and your own route versus partnering with maybe brands that you already have that relationship with and them helping you launch a line. Do you ever think about like that pure hundred percent yourself versus in partnership with? Yeah. And you know, these are conversations I always have with my managers as well. Like sure. what route would I want to go? I mean, I've seen a lot of creators go the route of like going through a partner or someone building out their brand and it works for them. But I've also seen some where it doesn't work because at the end of the day, you don't have complete control over that. Sure. And I think just the type of person that I am, I would like to have full creative control of what I'm doing. Um, So I think working with brands in terms of just small little collaborations, whether it's like you know, a limited edition line or something Mm -hmm. is great for the short term. But I think long term, I would want to own something on my own, like invest in it on my own with my own funds and kind of be more self-made in that sense. Yeah. That's so so exciting. It sounds (laughs) like I can see a world where now you take it full circle, not now, but when that, when that happens, you take it full circle and you're going back to Laurier and there's a case (laughs) and there's a case study on you where at the time (laughs) you were looking at case studies of these massive businesses. That would be amazing. That would be so amazing. I haven't gone back to Laurier since I graduated, which is insane. It's nuts to me that like there's some, there's some marquee people that have come out of, come out of Laurier in the creator world, mm-hmm. like creator music industry world over the past like five, six years. And I've only heard of one event where I think they they highlighted one or two people. Yeah. And, it's, and it's wild because we live in this world that you would, ex- you would expect that. And I feel like students would be so excited if you went <laughs> back and I, I can think of two or three other people as well. Yeah, I think actually they did, they had reached out about a year and a half ago about a like a career something but it was at the point where I already moved to LA and it was Hmm. it would have been a thing for me to fly all the way it just yeah but I'm sure you know once the world opens up again I know Ontario is going through a lot right now yeah (laughs) I'm sure there'll be more opportunities for that (laughs) so I want to ask though about analytics you were saying that like you love looking into the analytics you Mm -hmm. have this business background so like there's a very unique perspective that you have that maybe other content creators don't and might rely on their management or other or other partners to do so. Yeah. 
what are you looking at? Like, what data are you looking at that's a, a high signal to you that things are working well? I think so. In the beginning, when I first went full time, um, as I mentioned, I had just hit a hundred thousand subscribers. I was trying to figure out a strategy to continually grow. Mm. So at that point, I was looking at um, my YouTube analytics, seeing you know what videos had the highest watch time, what videos um, led to more subscribers, what videos uh, you know went viral, and like how could I recreate those. Um, so it was just, that was more of my strategy. I think now I've kind of moved more into the side where I look more at the analytics on what products that I'm talking about and how that translates into sales. So mm-hmm. I use various different like affiliate links and stuff through like reward style or magic links. Um, and that's a really amazing way. I feel like people will just put their links and like be like, okay, people are shopping through them, but they don't actually study them. Mm-hmm. I actually go back in there at least like, you know, once or twice a week or a month um, and study like, okay, these are the top links that I'm getting over the past, I don't know, three months. Like why don't I continually create content around that? Or maybe I will reach out to those brands. So there've been various times. And I think um, this is what I've done a lot to grow my brand partnerships. I will organically link to products that I love And if those products are selling really well, I'll take those screenshots, literally send them to the brand and be like, Hey, just thought I'd share, like these products are doing really well. Let's work together. (laughs) And there's been so many times where brands are like, that's amazing. Okay, cool. Let's, let's work together. And, and that's how I've created a lot of my brand partnerships. That's a genius. Yeah. Genius. (laughs) Because uh, wow. Wow, yeah. wow. This is gonna be this is gonna be something I think creators take away as in like, you know, why am I not doing this too? And especially mm-hmm. especially to the point of like trying to get to a situation where you want them to value where you want a brand to value you for your audience. And exactly. it, it seems like the easiest way to show them. And, and to your point, how can they say no? It's like th- so many sales are already getting yeah. driven through. Wow. Yeah. Wow, wow, wow. That is a that is a not a hack, but that is a powerful strategy to be using. For sure. And I've been doing that for the past four years and it's been working really well for me. Yeah. Okay. Take note. <laughs> Whoever's listening, if you're a brand, look for people like Aisha. If you're a creator, yeah. fo- follow this up. Yeah. So I'll end off on a, on a very light question. Mm-hmm. Who is your, outside of yourself, who is your mm-hmm. favorite creator right now? My favorite creator right now, I mean, this has been a long-standing favorite, but Jackie Ina, um, she creates beauty and lifestyle content as well. And she's been someone I've looked up to for years and years. Um, and since moving out to LA, we've become friends. She's been a really great support system as well for my own content. Mm-hmm. Um, and she, you know, is a black woman as well. Um, understands she's been on YouTube for over a decade as well. And she understands the challenges it takes to be a woman of color, a black creator in this space. Um, and I think it's really inspiring to see kind of how far she's come. She's, she launched her brand last year as well, and it's been doing amazing. So wow. I think she's someone I constantly look to, not only personally, but professionally as well. Yeah. Okay. One other question yeah. popped in my mind. I, yeah. The dream brand partnership outside of like what that looks like. Who, what is that dream brand? to work with? You know, and I don't even mean to sound weird about this, but I feel no. like every dream brand that I've wanted to work with, I've worked with, That's which cool. is like really exciting to say. I think just like a random dream brand, <laughs> like a Starbucks maybe, or like, cool. I'm trying to think what other like, yeah, like kind of one of those random brands that I always talk about. But in terms of beauty and lifestyle, I'm very happy to say that I've been able to work with every single brand that I've wanted to work with. Insane. Yeah. And I feel like if you if you get to that point as a creator, <laughs> as a brand, what else is there? What yeah. else is there to do? Well, yeah. in the brand partnership realm, then you start creating your own products. Of course, of course. But it's Starbucks or Smart Sweets. Everyone wants to hit me up. Cool. Let's Good manifest. <laughs> let's, let's manifest it here. Yeah, Aisha, it was so nice having you on. Thank you for Thank sharing you. knowledge. Thank you for taking us through that journey. I think people are going to get a lot from this. I hope so. This was really great, and it was great to catch up with you as well.